I want you to fill in the blank here with me. I want you to think of a word that goes in the blank. Spontaneity makes things blank. All right? Spontaneity makes things blank. How many of you said something to the effect of makes things fun? Raise your hand if that's what you thought. How many of you thought makes things stressful? Raise your hand. Makes things stressful. Okay, I figured we'd see more than that. Okay, maybe we'll do more unplanned things. All right, we'll see. Um, when I go on vacation, I usually plan what we are going to be doing every day. Raise your hand, every day. I, when I go on vacation, I just show up and we'll see what happens. Raise your hands. Okay, I'm surprised for the early service we're getting this many. Okay. <laughs> Being around large groups of people blanks me. Being around large groups of people blanks me. How many of you say energizes me? Okay. Oh, that's about a third. How many of you would say stresses me out, drains me? Oh, a lot of introverts in here. That was, that was one third to two thirds. I'm glad you all made it to church today. Okay. <laughs> I really am. I know it was an effort for you. You're gritting your teeth. Hopefully now you're glad you're here. After the opening song, you're probably not, okay? Just asking you to link up with the arm like I am drained, okay? When I get in the car and turn on the radio, I typically listen to the same radio station every day. Raise your hand. Wow. It depends on the day what I'll be listening to. Raise your hand. That's about half and half. Man, Michael, can, do, you, do you realize how difficult it must be for you to pick songs for Sunday morning? Because they, they don't even know what they want to listen to when they wake up. How, how are you going to figure it out when half the congregation, it depends on the day, right? Yeah, you just got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, I am a morning person. Raise your hand. Ooh, that's why this is the early service, right? I am an evening or night person. Raise your hand. Okay, there we go. Those are the same people that says spontaneity energizes me. Usually, they usually have that in common. Most people, people or night people, the people that get things done, get up early in the morning. Okay. Um, I am married to someone that in many ways is opposite of me. Raise your hand. That's almost every hand in the house went up. <laughs> the only people that didn't raise their hands were the people who are still single. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. You may want to stay that way. You don't have to get married. <laughs> Nowhere in this Bible does it say you have to get married. Paul says if you get married, you have problems. <laughs> he really did. He really did. That's, that's in the Bible. It's in Corinthians, okay? Uh, Here's why I share that, like, how many of you, if, I, if we're just honest, D, you can, D will be the first, the first five years of our marriage were very difficult in that we had to have two different people learn how to get along. How many of you would raise your hand and say that were true? Again, most of the hands go up. Like, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't stand up and shout, <laughs> amen. Man, our first five years were hard, really difficult. It's really difficult having two different people get in the same house and try to move forward together. Managing Dee's personality was a struggle for me. Managing my personality was an impossibility for her. It's hard. Then you have children. And it becomes chaos. And I'll say again, you don't have to have children. But yet, for some reason, we choose to. Here's my question. Why do some of us choose to get married? And why do some of us choose to have children, even though we know it's going to be very difficult managing the personalities? Why do we do it? Because it's worth it. It's worth it. And as difficult as it is to manage two people together, can you imagine 
how hard it is for 20 people to try to live together and operate together and move forward together. Can you imagine how difficult it would be for 100 people to learn how to live together and move forward together? And I want you to think about the impossible nature of our task for 1,000 people to live together, share life together, plan meals together. I mean, these ladies that do Wednesday night dinners, like a lot of you as moms, you can't even keep five people in your house healthy and they're trying to do it for 500. It's difficult. Relationships are hard. And so when we talk about the, the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the most diverse city in the entire Roman Empire. We're not nearly as diverse as what they were. It, it said that over 80 languages were spoken. It was like metropolitan New York City back in its day. People were very different. And what Paul could have done is he could have said, I'm going to plant a church for Jews over here. I'm going to plant a church for Gentiles over here. I'm going to place, plant a church for people of African descent over here. I'm going to plant a church over here. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? But is that what he did? And the answer to that's what? No, he says, I'm going to plant congregations that are open to everyone, and we need everyone. And then, while Paul was there, and he's super leader, super pastor, he's managing it, and if anybody gets out of line, he just does a miracle, and everybody remembers God's with them, right? But when he leaves town, and that strong personality isn't there anymore to hold it all together, man, wow! The relationships and the personalities start bursting at the seams. Differences are hard. And listen, this is what I'm going to share with you. What they taught me in seminary, this is literally what they taught in our How to Grow a Church class. And it was based much out of what they were doing at Willow Creek in Chicago and at Saddleback in, in California. What they taught us was know your niche. They taught the churches that are growing the fastest target a certain demographic. Rick Warren called it Saddleback Sam. In other words, he just said, I mean, it's in his book. He's got a picture of a white guy with these big 80s glasses, hair combed over on the side, walking in with a briefcase and a, and a tie on. He says, this is what most people in Saddleback Valley look like. And so everybody doesn't look this way, but I'm targeting Saddleback Sam and Saddleback Sally I'm targeting their family, and we're going to sing songs like their family would sing. We're going to dress like they would. We're going to preach sermons that would meet that family's needs. Just targeting, targeting. Know your niche. Know your target audience. And then grow your church where most people end up looking alike. And it's easy to do that because then people don't argue because the more the same you are, the less arguments there are. If D and I both love Italian food as our number one choice, which it is, it's really easy for us to choose a place to go out to eat. But if she's a vegetarian and I'm a meatitarian, it's going to make life very hard. Y'all get that? Some of you are living in the middle of it right now within your own households. But this is something that D and I, 10 years into marriage, learned through counseling. And the reason we had to go through counseling is because a judge was probably going to order it if we didn't do it on our own. It was difficult for us. And something we found out, she would, I remember we were in there and it was like a light bulb came on for both of us, um, where they had us read these personality traits. And I read, I'm like, do you really think this way? And she says, yes, that's how I feel all the time around you. And she was like, you're really like this? We went back to the counseling the next day. And um, they said, what, at the heart, what of it? She says, I just like order in my house. I like things to be planned. She would schedule out her day with all the kids. I mean, the kids were in bed. If they got in bed at 8.01, like the, the wall started to shake. Like, had to be 7.50. We were getting ready, brushing teeth. You know, it was always a schedule. Then I would roll in from a youth group activity and we're like, okay, kids, party time. And the kids are jumping around. I'm like, these you're busting up my schedule. And we just dealt with this all the time. Like, you come in, you're the party guy. I'm not the fun parent or whatever. And, 
But somebody had to keep my house in order. Do y'all understand that? And so when we're in counseling, she, we're sitting there and we're like, it's a struggle. But then she said, just a, a light bulb of wisdom. She says, you know what, though? Steve drives me crazy, but he keeps it fun. And I'm like, he keeps our house in order. And it's like we both realized the sparks that it created our first 10 years of marriage actually turned us into a good team of two very different parents. Do you all understand that? If you've got one parent who's just always structure, 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 and you've got all parent, another parent who's just fun, 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 like it actually brings balanced kids. And some of you are looking at Lucas and saying, is he balanced? I think pretty much. Okay, pretty much. That's what we need in the church. We don't want a church where everybody looks alike. We don't want a church where everybody thinks alike. We don't want a church where everybody acts alike. We don't want a church where everybody listens to the same music. We don't want a church where everybody's the same. And listen, does it make it hard to be really different? The answer to that is what? Yes but it's worth it. This is what Paul's going to communicate. We don't want to be people all the same age. We don't want to be people from the same race or culture. We don't want to be people from all the same educational bank backgrounds. We don't want to be a church where everybody just likes the same style of preaching. We don't want to be a church where everybody likes just likes the same kind of food. And this is what Paul is explaining to them when he gets word that there's divisions. Well, he says, as I appeal to you, they're a lot more different than we are. And they lived in their pockets, and they lived in their sides of towns, and yet they were supposed to come together and worship as one. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. Here's the problem. They're so different, they don't agree on anything. But here's what they need to agree on, is that our Lord is Jesus Christ. And we also need to agree on this, is that there be no divisions among you. How can we be different and yet agree? How can we be so diverse and yet not have divisions? Because the root for, word for diversity and division is the same. Do y'all get that? But here's what he's saying. I need you to be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. What around? The big picture. And he says, what I mean is that when each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or that's Peter, or some of you say, well, I, I like Jesus' way of doing it. While you're doing all that, you're just focusing on your differences instead of focusing on what should unite you. Instead of focusing on the big picture, you're not keeping the main thing the main thing. And so he points this out. If there's jealousy and if there's strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in the way of man? I don't care where you travel in the world. When you get to a town, certain kinds of people live on this side of the tracks and certain people live on that side of the tracks. I've been to over 40 countries and it never changes. Like I'll go across railroad tracks and this side is different than that side. It's that way all over the world. People self-segregate to be around people that look like them that fit in their HOA. And if you're not gonna look like our HOA, you can't be a part of the HOA. But we can't be that way in the COC. The Church of Christ. We can't allow that to happen here. So this is what Paul is saying. Disunity is a result of the eyes. They've got a bad case of the eyes. What are the eyes? I, 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 I. Do you see that? Whenever people are focusing on myself, my likes, my tribe's like, that is the way of man. Disunity always results of eyes and my tribes. 
What is it? The lifting of personal preferences above the overall good. Of course we're going to have personal preferences. Of, of course there's going to be certain type of praise songs that we like. Of course there's going to be certain academy classes. A certain, a, a, I follow Chip. I follow Ben. I follow Bud. I follow, do y'all follow what I'm saying? I want to be in that. That's why we encourage you, don't go to the same teacher all the time. You get enough of one guy all the time on Sunday mornings, me, have some diversity outside this room. That's why I even try to have somebody in this pulpit other than myself every once to six to eight weeks. It's not so I can have a week off. It's because I want you to hear from somebody other than I. I want you to have some diversity. This is what Paul reminds us for the overall good. This is what we got to focus on. All things are lawful. Yeah, yeah, you might have the freedom to do it, but not all things are helpful. Yeah, we could do what you're saying, but it wouldn't be helpful for the whole group. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. It might build up some, but it's not going to build up most. And it's difficult saying, what are we going to do to stay focused on reaching people who are not members here yet? And especially people who are unchurched. How many of you didn't grow up Catholic? Raise your hand if you didn't grow up Catholic. That's most of us. How many of you ever have attended a Catholic service? Raise your hand. Now, they, pr they pray to the same Jesus we do, but when you, you raise your hand, a lot of you, do you remember getting in there as a Baptist and you sit down and then all of a sudden everybody drops to their knees on the little kneeling thing on the bench? Do you remember that? And as a Baptist, what did you do at that point? What are these people doing? What's going on here? And so you get down there and all of a sudden they start doing this stuff, making signals, calling in football plays. Like you don't know what they're doing. Like what, what was that sign? Like, hmm, I mean, I went with my buddy, my, my my college roommate was a Eucharistic minister. And uh, he, he was up there doing all the stuff. And I'm just, he said, just follow me. You just do what I do. Okay. Then they start doing these chants. It sounds like chants, but it's, it's like our responsive reading, kind of. Hail Mary, full of grace, something, something. And they all know every word. And I felt so awkward. I'd been to church every single Sunday for the previous 15 years. And I had... I was so uncomfortable in that moment. Y'all follow what I'm saying? I'm like, I feel like an idiot in this place. I don't know what I'm doing. And then they all start going for, for communion. And they don't do communion like we do communion. And that priest is actually going to put his hand in my mouth to put a piece of bread in there, and that felt kind of creepy to me. And they're all drinking from the same glass. All he did is just ripe a little bit. And I'm like, man, that ain't good enough for me. <laughs> but everybody else is doing it, so okay, I'll take a drink. And then I drink it, and I think, that ain't Baptist grape juice. <laughs> Whew. That's different. And I go and sit down, and when I'm leaving, Father Jim's standing by the door. I'm walking up, I'm like, hey, give me a little high five there, a good sermon preacher. He said, you ain't Catholic, are you? And I'm like, how'd you guess? <laughs> All right, so he said, you know what? You're really not supposed to take communion with us. And I was a little bit put off by that. I'm like, well, I believe in Jesus just like you do. He says, but you don't believe in communion like we do. And so, okay, I guess I'm not welcome back. Now, I know why they do. And I actually went and had lunch with Father Jim after that. I understand we do look at, at communion differently, and I understand his point, and actually, I think he's right about what he said there, because I don't believe what they believe about communion. I don't believe in, that it represents what I think it represents. It's different. They believe it actually becomes the body and the blood of Christ. It's very different. But the reason I share this with you is when we invite people who aren't members here yet there are a lot of things that when you come here every week that seem normal to you that seem very foreign to them sometimes we wonder how come unchurched people don't go to church 
have you ever driven by a mosque and thought, hey, I need to stop and see what they're doing in there on Friday nights? How many of you have thought that? Like, I think I'd like to attend a mosque someday. A couple of hands, but most of, most of you are like, there's no way I would ever attend. That's how unchurched people feel when they drive by here every single day. Why would they come? They don't know what we stand for. And so when they do take a chance to come with a friend, and sometimes we'll see people, maybe we've got them here today, where family's not working quite right, or they don't feel like they're making connections in the community, and they come in here, the last thing we ever need to communicate to them is that we don't love each other, is that we don't get along. Is if we're clicking up and people see people or people making frowns at each other or after they're even here four weeks, they hear somebody make a snide comment about the music or the pastor or the youth pastor or the children's area. Like, it's not helpful. It doesn't build up. And this is why the apostle Paul says, here is the key to unity. Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. So, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This has to be our consideration in everything we do. I'm not going to seek out my own good, but I'm going to seek out the good of people who are around me, but don't necessarily look like me. And everything that I do, I want to make sure it's glorifying God, and I don't want to be a distraction to everyone else. And so what Paul says is, just as I try to please everyone and everything I do, now there's a reason why he says try here, because why? That's impossible. Michael can't pick songs that please, he's not going to pick one song that pleases everybody in this room at the same time. Y'all understand that, right? I'm not going to preach one sermon that hits everybody right in the heart spot every single week. It's not possible. There's not going to be an academy class that's just perfect. There's not going to be a youth group that, that meets every ki single kid every single way, the way they need every single week. It, it's not going to exist. But we try to reach everyone. And it, like a marriage, it's hard. The key to doing this is we can never seek our own advantage, but that of the many. And here's why that they may be saved. And that is talking about people who aren't members of First Baptist Corinth yet. Do y'all get that? Paul isn't doing this. But listen, Paul isn't saying to the Christian people in the congregation there, I need you to make different choices so that you get along together. That's not what he's saying. Ultimately, it's not about the people in the pew's happiness. It's about reaching lost people. That's the big picture. It's about reaching people who aren't members here yet. So what we try to do, th this is at the heart of it. I just want you to understand. We try to bring everybody together. We want to hear different opinions. But let me encourage you with this. Last week I said, a couple people asked me, are a lot of people complaining about the music? No. No. We don't have a lot of people complaining about the music. Not at all. We've got 5% say, I like a little more of this. 5% like a little more of that. 5% would like it to be louder. 5% would like it to be quieter. Like, we, we've got all kinds of mix about that. But here's what I'm not hearing as much as I wish I would. And this applies to all of you. It's okay to say this is how I feel and probably other people feel that way because that way we're hearing from different voices. But what we also need to hear, and I'm not hearing as much as this, how can me and my tribe, how can I, we, us, how can the people that are like me give up more of our preferences to meet the pe needs of people who have different preferences? Do y'all see the difference? There is a difference between not complaining. Sometimes people think, they hear a service on unity, 
and, and they think that I'm trying to communicate, you just need to shut up. You just need to zip it. Now, in marriage, sometimes that applies. But that's not what I'm trying to communicate. That's not what Paul's trying to communicate. What Paul's trying to communicate is the way we have oneness is that everybody is worried about meeting everyone else's needs. How can I give up my personal preferences for the sake of the whole, and even more importantly than that, for the people who aren't members here yet? Y'all, are y'all tracking with me? So this is why I say, like, I, I took a picture of Bud and I sent it out right after we opened the new parking lot. He was the only one on our staff. I'm not putting the other ones down. I don't know where they parked. But he took the furthest spot in the parking lot, the far back corner, and I sent it around. I said, that's leadership. It was raining that day, but Bud parked on the furthest parking spot away. That's not convenient for him. It's not convenient for him walking out. He's starting to be an old man. Do y'all follow that? But when he parks there, what's going through his mind? I want to park so that it will be more convenient for someone to be able to park up close. That's how this happens, Jesus says. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So that we're constantly saying, as one church, this is our thing. What can I do for you? What can I do for you? Ralph's constantly, Ralph Adams con constantly coming to me. How can I serve you today? How can I help today? How can I set up chairs? And the biggest thing I said is my favorite beatitude, blessed are the flexible for they shall not be broken. Remember that when you come here every week. It's in the gospel of first Steve, all right? I just want you to understand that. <laughs> blessed are the flexible for they shall not be be broken. And the reason we all need to be that, we're flexible when we bow, when we bend to reach others with the good news of the gospel. Amen? So, how can the Corinthians fix their problem of disunity? How can our church preserve it? We do have a great sense of unity here right now. We've done staff evaluations. And man, if there's anything that's screaming from those is that we have a unified church and that we love our staff and we want to reach people for Jesus. It just exudes out of those, all right? But this is how we preserve what we have. This is how he's telling the Corinthians, this is how you fix it. Now, he says, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. We've got differences, but we've got the same Holy Spirit. And there are varieties of service, different gifts of service, but there's only one Jesus, okay? And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Did you see the Trinitarian reference in there? Spirit, Son, God the Father. And he empowers them all, the gifts, in what percentage of followers of Christ have gifts? All of them, every one, right? To each. There's not one of you that doesn't have this. If, you have got, if you've got Jesus, if you've got the Holy Spirit in your heart, each one of you has been given the manifestation of the Spirit. For what purpose? For the common good, for the whole. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. We've got differences. That's what he, of course you guys in Corinth are different. I set it up that way. I intentionally didn't do targeted niche graphics and marketing there in Corinth. I'm trying to create something bigger than nobody else has done in the history of the world. But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them. Look at the focus. The focus is on the whole but the way you have unity as a whole is each one of them doing what God designed them to do. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts yet one body. Listen, we need, this is saying, we need the older people to say, this is how older people think. You know why? 
Because middle-aged people and young people don't think that way. If we're going to reach older people, if older people don't tell us this is how older people think, we, I'll give you an example of this, okay? When young people come in from outside into a completely dark room, within one second their eyes adjust and they can see where to sit. Older people, do your eyes still work that way? I mean, it's getting now when I want to read. If I'm not standing in the sun, I can't read anything. I'm just now starting to understand when I come in, like my 50-year-old eyes, when I come in from the outside, it takes time for me to adjust. Therefore, I say, listen, I know the young people like it dark in here like a concert, but at the beginning when people are sitting down, we've got to bring the lights up a little so people can find their way to a seat. If older people don't tell us we can't see, how can we meet the needs of the entire body? Do you see that? We need you to tell us. But at the same time, we need the young people to tell us what reaches their generation. That's why Kendall's teaching this class right now on Generation Z. Understanding people that, were, that are Lucas's age and younger. The first generation raised 100% of the times looking at this all day. They think differently than we do. Therefore, we need Generation Z saying to us, this is how we think. This is how you're going to reach my peers. But collectively, the, I, the Generation Z can't say to the older people, I have no need of you. Nor again can the older people say to the younger people, I have no need of you. The people who grew up in a white church can't say to the people who grew up in a black church, we don't need you. The people who like country music can't say the people who like rap music. Y'all follow what I'm saying? We all need each other. This is why he's saying you got to get this attitude. That there be no division in the body, none. But that the members may have the same care for one another. Yes, I care about people my age, my likes, look like I do, dress like I do, have the education I do. But I care just as much for this other group. So these are my preferences. Educate me as to what the preferences are for them so we can balance it out here and walk forward together. You get that? That needs to be a big what? Amen. And it's our job as pastors, as leaders, to recognize people's needs and try, as Paul says, to reach them all. It's an impossible task, but we've got to try came across a, uh, a picture this past week um, of a little baby. Look at this. Can you see it on the screen? Got the death grip on the doctor's apron. You know when children come out of the womb, if, if they're normal, this is the way God made them, they come out doing what? Reaching. They've been in the womb all these times. They don't know anything. But when they're reaching, what are they saying? I need something. They don't even know what they need, but they're saying, I need him. I need someone else to he help me. We're born singing, lean on me. We all need somebody to lean on. And as we get older, people think, well, maybe that's true for a baby, but it shouldn't be for grown-ups. Because if you're a grown-up and you admit you're needy, that means you're weak. But God created a perfect man. His name was Adam. He had no faults whatsoever. He had no sin in his heart whatsoever. But when God looked at him, being there by himself, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help for him helper fit for him why because God created Adam to be needy he needed the helps of others it is not a result of sin in fact it is a result of sin when we say we don't need the help of others do you understand that when we say I'll just do it on my own I don't need anybody else that's the devil talking that's what got the devil kicked out of heaven do you get it we all need each other. So I want you all to turn into preachers right now, and I want you to look to your lean-on-me partners, and I want you to tell them this. 
preach to them right now. Go, say, you need me. You do it? Tell them again. I'm not sure they heard you. Now you need to say back to them, oh, well, yeah, well, you need me. But then we have to admit, admit this. Yeah, you need me, and I need you. Will you say that to four or five people around here right now? Make eye contact and say that to four or five people. I know this stresses some of you out. The people are like, this is why I like to stay at home. Man, I often think this of you, One Church Calvary, you're a bunch of needy people. But I compliment you when I say that. Because when you recognize that, and when I recognize it as a pastor, I'm just seeing you the way God created you to be. We need each other. And so this is why. When I ask for your opinions on things, I really want them. About 100 of you have filled out my evaluation. Okay? And a lot of times people go, well, I don't have a problem with Steve. I'm not going to write it in. Or I do have a problem with Steve, but I don't want to be negative. Thank you. All right? If you are going to say something, make sure it's constructive. Say it in a nice way. Our pastor stinks. I wish he'd quit. That's not constructive, okay? <laughs> None of you said that. At least I don't know yet, but got the results, okay? So, uh, but I do. There's one line. If you don't fill out anything else in here, go to the line where it says, I suggest. And give me your opinions. But don't just give me your opinions on what you and your tribe need. Give me opinions on how you might be able to help someone who's not like you. How our church might do a better job. Now, here's the deal. I'm looking for a lot of ideas, and it's my job with the leadership team and the staff to try to balance them. And I don't want you to think if we don't do your idea that I think that's a stupid idea. I don't want you to think that. But I'm trying to find balance. And if I see a lot of people saying something like, hey, maybe that's something we can pull off. Like the Habitat House. That wasn't on my radar. But I had like 15, 20 people say, hey, have you ever thought of building a Habitat House? Hey, have you ever thought? All different corners. And then finally I said, you know what? We need to build a Habitat House. And then one of our members came to me and says, I'll run a project for a Habitat House if you let us do it. I'm like, let you do it. I want you to do it. I'd love you to do it. And then before I know, we got 100 people da- doing that down here. It was awesome. That came from people's opinions. Do you understand that? So if you, Doug's going to send out this afternoon my evaluation link again. All right? You don't have to go down there and put me all fours and make me Jesus. I'll expect it. But if you don't put anything else, go to the I suggest and say, here's an idea. And it might be, here's what me and my tribe would appreciate more of this. But if we don't get it, that's okay. But here's the idea of maybe how me and my tribe could help this group. I would love to see teenagers say, how can I serve the senior adults in here? I'd love to have teenagers coming to me. What can we do to help senior adults? especially in the winter months. I'd love to have older adults say, how can we make the teenagers feel more loved? How can I volunteer to help young moms? I realize I'm older and I can't do it a lot anymore, but man, I remember what it was like to be a young mom. And this is why the Bible says, once we get all these opinions, watch what Paul teaches in the book of Ephesians. We just came through this, but I gotta say it again. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. That's the pastors. These are the leaders of the church, okay? Here's our purpose, to equip the saints to prepare you for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body of Christ. I've said this many times. If you've been here very long, hopefully you'll get this, all right? If you've paid attention. Why do you pay me to be your pastor? You pay me to say it. Put us to work, like five of you got it, all right? Let's say it together. You pay me to put you to work. That's what the Bible commands me to do. It's not my job to do the work of the ministry. It's my job to equip, prepare, train you to do the work of the ministry. You tell me what ministries need to be done, can help our community, help your tribe, how you're willing to serve others. But it's our job to balance all those things and then to put you to work. That's our job. 
When we do that, look at what it says. We all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. What keeps a church unified? This is what Paul taught in Corinthians, and he's saying it to the Ephesians. You want to stay unified, then everybody gets unified through the works of service. If you walked in the lobby today, you saw something painted out there. We've had one church Calvary for a while, but we've got our three things that we ask all of our members. We don't ask a lot other than giving everything you have to Christ. But every week we ask every member, if you're going to be on the list, make sure you're worshiping. That's the number one thing. Being here, giving praises to God, but also listening to his word. That trumps all other things. I don't want you down in the nursery for two services. You're cheating God out of listening to his word. You follow that? You're cheating God out of singing his praises with his people. Don't serve during two, okay? But here's the deal. Serve at least one. It's said many, in many organizations, 80% of the people do 20% of the work, and 20% of the people do 80% of the work. But it's not been that way here for most of us. And then, of course, be a part of the connect group. Worship one of our hours, connect one, serve one. 90 minutes, serve in some way. And I want to share this with you. And a lot of times I think people don't understand this. A former youth pastor of mine used to say this. It's possible to be committed to your church and not be committed to Christ. But it's impossible to be committed to Christ and not be committed to your church. Pharisees were committed to the synagogue, but they weren't committed to Jesus. But it is impossible to be committed to Jesus and not be serving in the local church. And that, my friend, is the big picture. That's the big picture, is we're all called to worship. We're all created needy. We need to connect. And we're all created to serve. We try to please everyone in everything we do, not seeking our own advantage. That's what people fight about is me and mine. But instead, we're focusing on what's the many and why it's for people that aren't members here yet. So 